Uh, the next speaker is, is um, Dan Wolf. I, I don't have a copy of the program here, so I'm sort of like um, uh, speaking from ignorance. But um, uh, the title of, of uh, okay, Dan is, is a director of the International Lifeline, Lifeline Fund, and uh, he'll be speaking about his work in Uganda about mobilizing communities f to improve water and energy and sanitation. Um, and I, I, I believe that Dan Daniel has a, a really an interesting um, background in history. He might say if just a few words about what brought him to, to this project. So I'm Dan Wool. I am the founder uh, of the International Lifeline Fund. Uh, I'm a human rights lawyer. Uh, I'm a lawyer who's done a lot of work in human rights, I should say. Uh, I had been successful in a particular lawsuit, uh, believe it or not, against the government of Iraq many years ago, uh, several years ago, for taking Americans hostage during the uh, first Gulf War. And uh, as a result of that, I got a nice little legal fee, and I used that to start uh, the International Lifeline Fund. Our goal <laughs> is to promote sustainable interventions that would have the greatest uh, possible impact in uh, improving health and reducing human misery at the lowest uh, possible cost. And when you're putting your own money into these things, that becomes a very important thing to you. So we have uh, projects in Uganda, Darfur, Kenya, Haiti, and Tanzania. Uh, at least we've had projects in those uh, five countries during the years since we established the organization. We became <laughs> operational in 2006. And initially, we worked mainly with refugees and displaced persons, but that evolved uh, now we work uh, largely with impoverished communities. Uh, our largest uh, project is in Uganda, a country of 35 million, where 90% of the population rely on biomass for cooking. That means they are cooking with uh, charcoal and wood. 40% uh, of the population lacks access to clean drinking water. A significantly larger percentage lacks, ad lacks access to adequate sanitation. And this is in a country of 35 million people. So over the last uh, seven years, uh, Lifeline has provided 270 clean water points. Uh, and we have uh, distributed and or sold 120,000 stoves. Those are our two main projects, clean water and clean cooking. The stoves uh, save 50% uh, on fuel use and approximately 1 million beneficiaries. In 2003, LifeLive began what is what we call the H2O Plus uh, project. It is a uh, holistic intervention that is designed to ameliorate the uh, dire health and socioeconomic conditions confronting impoverished villagers throughout northern Uganda. And we are commencing this project in uh, Apach district. Now, project is focusing on two particular interventions, clean water and clean cooking. Uh, with clean cooking, we are providing clean cook stoves. So why water and why stoves? Well, in the time that I've gone out to uh, impoverished communities in Africa, I can say that if you are in a rural village in Africa and you want to do two things that will most impact the lives of a African villager and the uh, health and uh, livelihood of that community, you will uh, address the issues of clean water and you will address the issue of cooking. Clean water we all know about. That's uh, what everybody is gathered here for. A few people know much, I, I would think, about the cooking issue. And when I try and uh, promote the, what we're doing to people, this is what I have to spend all my time explaining because it's not immediately obvious. But you can imagine if you did not have a stove in your house and you did not have any way to, to get uh, to cook things, how, what would you do? You, there's no fuel, there's no electricity, there's no uh, gas, uh, there's no uh, propane, nothing. You'd have to go outside, you'd have to chop down some trees, you'd have to build a fire. Pretty soon if you're in a community with a few hundred people, there are no trees around and you have to go further and further out. So you're spending a lot of your time uh, uh, collecting firewood and, uh, and then cooking with it uh, is a very, very time-consuming task. 
So uh, it's also a very dangerous task. So these are two things, if you look at uh, uh, Juliet's slides, that once you get past the infant mortality stage, these are the two major killers in Africa, in, in village life. 22,000 children in Uganda under the age of five die due to waterborne disease. 20,000 Ugandans die every year due to indoor air pollution. That is what's causing the acute respiratory infection, the pneumonia, <laughs> the high rates of, of disease, uh, of mor morbidity and mortality. In terms of time, I, I think that it's no exaggeration to say that, that the engines of African uh, village life are, fem are women. And the problem is, is that the typical household, and what I mean here really is the typical Ugandan woman, and you might say typical African woman, spends two hours of her time every day collecting water, another two hours of her time every day collecting wood, and somewhere between maybe about five or six hours a day cooking. So that's 10 hours a day. That doesn't leave a lot of time for the engine of economic activity in the village to do other tasks. So that is why we are trying to challenge, to attack both of these uh, particular problems. The other reason is that in the last two decades, and this is not just Uganda, but Uganda has lost over one third of its forest cover. And uh, a very, very significant cause, if not the chief cause of that, believe it or not, is the use of wood for cooking. Literally, the average African family uh, living in a village will consume 15 trees per day. And if you're cooking with charcoal, um, per year, excuse me, and if you're cooking with charcoal, you will consume an average of 50 medium-sized trees per year. Now, as I mentioned before, we are focusing on a Poch district with the H2 Plus project. Why a Poch? Well, for one, it's only a few kilometers, 50 kilometers from our base, so we can get there easily. It's a manageable size of 370,000. 40% uh, of the people lack access to clean water, making it a very typical Ugandan district. And there was a motivated uh, local government in Poch, which obviously makes program implement implementation a lot easier. And finally, there was the presence of a CLTS project. So uh, we, we talked a little bit before about community-led total sanitation. This gives an opportunity to compare the CHC approach with the CLTS approach. Our goals for this district, number one, to achieve 100% water coverage throughout the district. Universal coverage, which will require the creation of 350 new water points by 2017. So far, we have, uh, I think we're about 45 right now. Uh, in each village where we create a new water point, the goal is to create and establish a CHC, which we are doing. We want to uh, sensitize 35,000 households, that's every single household in all of these villages, on improved hygiene and health practices. Elimination of open defecation in all 350 communities. Uh, our goal is to achieve 60% fuel efficient stove adoption rate. That means taking people away from open fire cooking and transforming them into FES, fuel efficient stove cookers. Uh, the reason why we have 60% and not 80 or 90 or 100 is the, the uh, object here is to get people to buy stoves rather than to give them away. And so we won't sell them to everybody, but uh, we believe that 60% is a reasonable goal and in the process create income generating opportunities for about 3,000 micro entrepreneurs, mainly women, a total cost of $3.5 million, approximately $20 per person, per beneficiary. This is just an example of uh, our creating a new, a new water point in the Posh district. So why CHCs and why did we get involved in that? Now I have to say that when I first learned about uh, community health clubs, with all due respect to Anthony and um, Juliet, I thought it was an exciting idea, but I was not 100% convinced it would work. Um, you know, the, I, working in a place like northern Uganda is a bit different uh, than Rwanda and a bit different, I think, than Zimbabwe. Uh, we're talking about a community that is extremely fragile, that has been ravaged by 20 years of civil war, where there is a major dependency mentality. And what this concept of bringing people together in a community and having them sort of rise up on their own, take responsibility for their own health, and gather together 
every week for 26 weeks or 20 weeks, and that's the, just the start, is, is kind of amazing that that could possibly happen and, and, and a little bit unbelievable. Uh, you know, this is a dependent community, a dependency mentality community. And, you know, if you don't give them, this is my experience, if you don't give people, tea, what, no tea and biscuits, no incentive, nothing extra to, commu to, to, to go to these events, not necessarily that people are going to come. And then these were uh, to be events that, uh, that are, that are uh, led uh, and orchestrated by local community leaders. Uh, in a village of 500 people, 100 households, I was skeptical actually that you could have the capacity in that community to find somebody that could actually uh, uh, run these uh, CHCs that could, could, could orchestrate the program in a way that would be successful and effective. So uh, we started the program, I got some pretty good reports from the field, and just three months ago, I went to Uganda. And I did what, uh, what Anthony did. I didn't tell anybody where I was going. I showed up at the last minute. I didn't even tell my team where I was going because I didn't want to have any, uh, I didn't want the community to have any prior knowledge. I didn't want anybody to, uh, to know what was happening. I didn't want to see a, any type of, uh, anything that wasn't exactly what normally happens. So I showed up out of the blue and truly it was amazing. Uh, we're told I was in the communities of about 100 households. I would say at each community, approximately 60 or 70, uh, about 50 or 60 people showed up, yet they were competing with two other major events during those, day, th those days. There was a funeral going on at one of the, in one of the communities, a major funeral. Uh, and then in another community, there was a major anti-corruption initiative. And yet uh, 60 households from a community of 100 households showed up. Uh, the session was mind-blowing, uh, to say the least. I mean, I, I don't, the way this stuff, this is organized, and the way the women uh, who led the, the, uh, the club uh, communicated to the club was extremely, extremely effective. There were songs, there were uh, claps, uh, there were that, you know, just to get things interesting, there, were, there, there could be drama, and everybody was fixated on the message, and everybody was participating. I would say that 50% of the individuals who participated, who were in, at the club, actually spoke. Everybody was fixated on what was happening, and it was a single message that was being conveyed. So you couldn't possibly miss the message. And perhaps more than that, and this is something that, that Juliet and, and Andrew had never really communicated to me, is that this became the beginning of civic society in, in these villages, because there, were no, there, were no, there was no community organization prior to the establishment of the CHC. So you could see the pride that people had. You could see the, the you could, you could, the owner, the sense of ownership was, was practically palpable. Uh, and this becomes a, a really excellent means of, of community uh, empowerment. So what we wanted to do is expand the CHCs to cover an area that Anthony talked and Juliet talked about a bit but is, uh, is our core program, uh, or one of our two core programs, and really our signature initiative, which is uh, promotion of fuel-efficient stoves. And now, uh, one of the problems that we've had is promoting fuel-efficient stoves as a, a economically-based intervention in villages. And the CHCs are going to become a vehicle for that. Now, in order to be successful for a stove program, really, you can give stoves away, you know, for free. Uh, you can train people, but ultimately, how many can you train and how many stoves can you give? Not too many. If you really want to alter and transform the way people cook, you have to create a, a you have to do this through private markets. And we have been trying to do that at Lifeline, and we've had some success doing that in towns uh, where people cook with charcoal. Uh, we have sold uh, 40,000 stoves uh, since 2008. Um, and the, 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 it's possible to do this. Uh, it's, it's difficult. But what makes it easier is that people are cooking with charcoal. And in literally six weeks, this stove, which costs us about 6 or $7 to produce, and we sell for about 9 or 10 uh, or 8, uh, will pay itself back. So soon, 
the individual who's buying the stove is literally making money off of their investment. The average uh, family spends about, I think, in Africa, literally about eight dollars to ten in, in Uganda, about eight to ten dollars on on charcoal a month. So if you save fifty percent of that, that's four or five dollars a month. Uh, if you're living on two dollars a day, that becomes a lot of money. Uh, the community liked this stove so much, they called it the Akello Cooch. They named it themselves, which means uh, the peacemaking stove. Uh, the idea being that it brings peace to the household. So. The challenge is, how, did we get, how do we sell stoves in rural markets? I mean, our, our initial goal was to sell them both in, uh, in towns and in uh, urban and peri-urban areas, but also in the rural areas where, where most of the people are and where the most extreme poverty is. And we had a, a real difficulty because while people value money, uh, most, most people in African villages don't really value time in the same way. So, um, so if they don't value time, they're not going to spend uh, their money on a stove. And the problem is you're not going to get somebody in a village, frankly, to spend $10 on a stove. So we needed to reduce the price. We needed to deal with the fact that people were not going to pay, that they didn't really have knowledge about the benefits of the stove, and that even if they did, the cost of getting the stoves to them and selling them one at a time uh, makes the program uh, cost ineffective and, and uh, dwarfs even the price of actually producing the stove. So one thing we set out to do is we developed a new uh, wood-burning stove that uh, only costs us $2 to make. Uh, it's efficient, 50% uh, fuel savings, and this is a durable product that could last two to three years, plus it's portable. You can take it from one place to another, look inside or outside the home. And this is the model that we have uh, recently developed. I know it looks very simple, but believe me, I've been out there for seven, eight years uh, on this kind of work, and it took a long time to get to uh, this particular point. Uh, but this stove is, is, is quite good, and it's been uh, uh, tested internally by us. It's being externally tested, uh, and we spent a lot of time and effort on it. We might put a metal top um, over the stove rather than using the, the clay one, because the first thing that will deteriorate are those hot supports. So how are the CHCs going to help us solve this problem? Well, first of all, we'll be dealing with an audience that is already sensitized, that already cares about their health, that has already been through the first stage uh, of training. And so uh, this is going to be a very receptive audience for us to sell these stoves to and to, uh, to sensitize the community. We can sensitize everybody at once because everybody's meeting on a weekly basis anyway. Uh, and so everybody is there. Uh, we have a phenomenal uh, a facilitator, and I, I'll tell you, the two facilitators that I saw, it was kind of like, it was a, I, I would have thought that these were professional educators, and yet they emerged uh, directly from the village. Uh, so we can uh, do the training, we can market all at once, and this group that's formed becomes a collective group that we can <coughs> sell the stoves to, to. So instead of doing one at a time, we can literally uh, have a group purchase and bring the stoves in all at once and that greatly facilitates our distribution problems. So uh, uh, I'm very hopeful. We have not reached this stage yet in the project. Uh, we're still at the, uh, at the stage where we are providing the health and hygiene, cha uh, hygiene training, but um, from what I've seen, uh, this stands a, a pretty good chance of working. If there are any questions, how much? Or do you want to do yours and then have questions for both of us? Okay. Questions. I think that people want to come up here. Is that okay? So I can. Uh, thank you, Dan. My name is Jen Navnyamurumba, and I'm from Uganda. I have two questions. How are you planning to work with the water source committees? Policy requires that each source should establish a water source committee. And then you're planning to establish community health clubs. How do you plan to link the two? Because that is a policy requirement. And the second one, 
How do you also plan to relate and link with the village health teams, the extension staff at the district level, at the sub-county level, at the parish level? Because that is within government requirement. So if you could clarify that for me, then I would be very happy. And then lastly, it's just a comment. I'm actually using the stove in my house. The Calicooch? Yes. What do you think of it? It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Are you from uh, northern Uganda then? From the oh, okay. Great. Well, it's good to know that the stove has gotten out there. So uh, let me ask, answer those questions. Uh, first of all, in every uh, community uh, where we establish a water point, yes, uh, we do also establish a water user committee. Uh, we did that. Uh, that preceded uh, the establishment of the um, community health club. So. Uh, the Water User Committee, uh, we have been creating separate from the health clubs, but if I'm not mistaken, do you in some instances actually have the health, the, the, health, the, the user committees established through the health club? Yeah. So we haven't, we haven't done that before, but, but I'm sure that is going to happen. And I think also that uh, the Water User Committees in some sense then become uh, responsible uh, answerable to the health club. So the health club actually becomes an, a, 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 an extra source of monitoring the effectiveness of the, of the water user committee. Uh, because if, if people don't perform, you now have a, a unified club that can, uh, that can take action. Whereas in the past, uh, if a water user committee doesn't perform, there's really no one to go to. So uh, I think that the two work uh, hand in glove. Uh, the uh, have I answered that, that full question? I think so. I'm sorry? So, so, so the, the next uh, part of the question uh, concerning the relationship with government. So the reason, as I mentioned initially, that we chose uh, a posh district is that uh, the government was, uh, ex ex we worked with them before, they were extremely receptive to this particular intervention. Uh, and so, and actually they, they have, uh, we moved our, pro our, our water team to a Apache district. They gave us a, um, a, a office within, uh, within their headquarters uh, out of which we work. They choose all of the water points. We work with them in choosing each water point. And, uh, and so we work with uh, each level of government uh, in, a in doing uh, all of those interventions. Go ahead, sir. Um, but, okay, I, I think we should take one or two more questions. It's obviously, uh, say, Mr. Truba, I think, at the back. Uh, I don't know if that's a good, I, we'd love to see I your face. <laughs> Uh, thanks. Great presentation. Um, at the beginning, you mentioned. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. My name is Dave Truba. I'm with the Water Supply and Sanitation Collaborative Council. At the beginning, you mentioned um, choosing a potch because uh, there was also an ongoing uh, community-led total sanitation program, and by working there, you had the opportunity to perhaps link with it or compare the CHCs. I wonder if you could just mention a little bit about how that worked, if it went well, or if there were challenges. Well, I, I should say that's a little early, um, so it's hard for me to answer that question. It's just that uh, the government has been implementing those projects, and uh, and you know, in the villages where we've been operating, we're establishing the, the CHCs. Mm -hmm. So, and all of those villages have, that I know of, uh, there is not yet a CLTS established in the same villages where we have established CHCs. Mm -hmm. So, it, side by side, will be uh, eventually we can compare results. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't, I wouldn't say that was a principal driver. So I don't really have much more to add to that. Thanks. It was just a, it was sort of a side benefit. Hi, I'm Michael Davidson. I'm an agricultural consultant doing work on the Catalyst program in Uganda. So my question is this, as you go around the villages, you're working with CHCs, do you think they're a venue for educating population on agricultural techniques, irrigation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? I think that, that's an excellent question. I mean, I, I think the CHC has become an excellent vehicle for introducing all kinds of uh, initiatives into the villages. I, obviously, uh, it has to be one at a time, um, but, uh, but I don't see why. I, 
the thing is you're dealing with an, a highly motivated group of people who are, tr who are trying to better their lives, and so you have a receptive audience. Right, but right for now, them. As, as of this point, there hasn't been any program specific. No, no, not yet. 